Welcome back to Hot Flashes and Cool Topics, everybody. Today we have Karen Katz with us. And Karen is the former CEO of Neiman Marcus Group. And Colleen and I, as you know, as our listeners know, we love Neiman Marcus and we love to quiz each other. Or actually, <laughs> Colleen quizzes me about the Neiman Marcus, Marcus Christmas, Christmas holiday yes. yes catalog. And so I've met Karen through my husband and it just worked out. I thought, oh, it'd be great to talk to her on our show. So welcome, Karen. Well, it's nice to be here. Thank you, uh, Bridget and Colleen, for inviting me. Well, we just think it's really great that you are a female CEO or held this position. And you were with Neiman Marcus for 33 years. Is that right? Exactly. For most yeah. of my adult life, I like to say. Wow. And I mean, I think that's great that you are, you know, your former CEO. How long were you CEO of Neiman Marcus Group? I was CEO for eight years. And previous to becoming CEO, I was president of the corporation for nine years. Okay. Okay. So you started as, and I'm going through my notes, you started, you worked your way up. You d- didn't enter into as a, you know, branch manager or, well, you, you started, at the, I want to say the bottom because you were at the bottom, but you started mid-level and you worked your way up. How hard was that? Yeah. I, so I had been a buyer at a department store. I live in Dallas now, but I'd been a buyer at a department store in Houston. And then I decided moved to Neiman Marcus as an assistant store manager. And frankly, I've said this to to people my entire career and my life. Like if you had met me in high school, I was the least expected person to become the CEO of anything because that just wasn't my path. But, you know, I kind of found that as I accomplished one position, I thought, well, maybe I could do the next position. And kind of one thing led to another. And you know, all of a sudden I, you know, look behind me and I had come quite a long way in my career. And, you know, I'm proud of that, but I'm probably prouder of the fact that I, I think it gives a path for women who don't necessarily ever dream about becoming a CEO, that it really is possible if you work hard and you surround yourself with good people and those kinds of things. Yeah. And that was, you know, another question I had was, being a woman in a CEO position of such a large company, were you around a lot of other women in a similar position? Did you run into that a lot? Yeah, I will say that the retailing industry, the industry itself was kinder to women, if you will, than a lot of other industries. And I think that was, you know, part of being in the fashion luxury industry. And so there were a few women that had been CEOs of other you know, pretty large retailers before me. I was actually, strangely enough, the second woman to lead Neiman Marcus because the company was founded by a woman and her brother in 1907. So Carrie Marcus Neiman, she was really kind of the first president of the company. So when I came along, I have to give great respect to her because even though most people thought I was the first female CEO, there really was somebody before me. There were some good role models, and I hope I was a good role model to other women. So you started in 1985 as a merchandise manager, and you worked your way up. There have been a lot of changes, not just in fashion, but for women in the corporate world, and also for online. And I know you played a big role in Neiman Marcus in bringing the brick and mortar to an online presence. How was that transition? Well, we were very early in embracing digital transformation. People talk about it today, but Neiman Marcus was the first department store to go online and the first luxury company to go online in 1999. So to kind of put that in perspective, Amazon basically started in 1995, right around then. eBay started in 1995. So just to, you know, kind of give your listeners, you know, some perspective. So we started just a few years later. So it was very, very early. The good news for us was we had a big catalog business. So people of a certain age remember that Neiman Marcus used to send out lots and lots of catalogs. And so we had that base. We knew how to fulfill product, the merchandise that you wanted to buy. 
It's the same as when you fulfill it from a catalog. We had agents that you called, you know, 1-800, whatever, Neiman Marcus, to place orders. So all of that back of the house, that was easy for us because that was already in place. The hard part was really shifting to online and getting the customers to understand that it was safe to buy online, but even harder than our customers were the luxury vendors that we did business with. And so, you know, you think about, I don't know, any of the luxury folks, Chanel, Louis Vuitton, Prada, Gucci, any of them, there was real resistance to starting a business online because the Europeans at the time were very far behind the U.S. when it came to online shopping. Oh my God. I, you know, I didn't even think about that. And I can remember when you started talking about the 1-800, I'm like, that's right. That's how we had to do it, <laughs> you yeah. know, call to place an order or even fill out the little thing inside, you know, the little oh, order form, okay. stick it in the mail. Oh my goodness. That's I right. forgot about that. Yeah. With a check. With a check. So. With a right. check. That's right. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Were you responsible for kind of convincing them to give online a try or was it just kind of trial and error? No, I spent, I, mean, so I spent my first few years when I became president of what we called at the time Neiman Marcus Direct because it was still a catalog business. And then we moved to doing NeimanMarcus.com. I spent so much time in Europe with our European partners I used to say groveling. I mean, my knees, you know, had just terrible sores on me. <laughs> but begging them to join us. And, you know, it was kind of funny. Once we got a couple of people who were more forward thinking of our European vendors to embrace that e-commerce really was the path. I mean, it's really hard for people that I talk to about this to even understand like, what were they thinking? Why wouldn't they join? You know, it just wasn't the way people thought about things in you know, 99, 2000, 2001. But once we got a couple of people, there was a little bit of a, you know, kind of, I need to keep up with the other a luxury vendor. So it came a little bit more quickly. It was really hard work though, those first few years. Yeah, I, I mean, I can understand that. I guess, you know, when something is new, you're just scared about it. And you're exactly. nervous. Yes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure, I don't know if they thought about the whole counterfeit market. Ish. Yeah. I think it existed, but I think that they were most nervous. And this kind of goes to the counterfeiting or, you know, gray market of the goods. They were most nervous about their brands. And we couldn't really appreciate it then that, you know, WWW worldwide really meant worldwide. And, you know, when you went online, those products were available on a worldwide basis in most cases. And so they were just very protective of their brand and they wondered how it was going to be broadcast to the rest of the world. And I think that they were right. As I look back on it, I think they were right to be nervous about it at the time it felt like they weren't being forward thinking enough about e-commerce. But frankly, it was the combination of both of those things. And like I said, most of them we won over and you know we became their largest partners uh, without question, both in the stores, which we still you know did lots and lots of business and online. And it gave us an opportunity to serve customers that didn't live in a Neiman Marcus city, Nashville being one of them, uh, where you all live, an opportunity to still shop with Neiman Marcus on NeimanMarcus.com until you got to a city where there was a Neiman Marcus store. Right. Because when, when you said that, I'm hearkening back to the days in Kentucky when I would get the catalog in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. Uh, so uh, I think e-commerce really helped broaden our reach and broaden their reach to, you know, the customers that had interest in those products in different places. Yeah. You have sales, well, at the time, sales of approximately $5 billion, and you were employing over 1,500 employees. 15,000. 15,000. Oh, at a zero, you were employing over <laughs> 15,000 employees. What was that like to be CEO of Nima Marcus? Well, I mean, it was an amazing job. <laughs> Let me say that, you know, and I, I had to, at any given time during my eight years as CEO, I had to kind of 
pinch myself because again, you know, I wasn't one of those people that, you know, that was my whole lifelong dream, but, but there I was, and I could never let go of that wonderment that I had achieved that kind of role, but I loved the role. And I think what I loved best about it was that I loved being around our customers and we had, you know, a very interesting and, and, and Neiman Marcus still does, you know, the most affluent consumers in the world shop at Neiman Marcus, and they were all very interesting people from interesting places. And they all had interesting stories about how they had achieved whatever they had achieved. So I loved being around our customers. Having come up in the company over 33 years, I didn't, of course, didn't know all 15,000 employees, but I knew a lot of the employees. And it gave me great satisfaction to either see people grow in the company or be able to see them when I went to visit stores or warehouses or, you know, wherever I was traveling, that gave me great satisfaction. And, you know, we, there was a lot to be proud of from the amazing history of Neiman Marcus. Like I said, it was started in 1907. The company was a company of first, you know, it was, you know, one of the first catalog companies, Sears Roebuck was before it, but first catalog company, this is kind of still hard to believe, but it was the first company to come out with gift cards. So now gift cards are ubiquitous, right? But Neiman Marcus was the first company to actually have a gift card. We were really the first department and luxury store to have e-commerce. We were the first store to have a loyalty program in circle was was born in 1983, I believe. So there were a lot of firsts of the company. And it was really a wonderful place to work. And, you know, a lot of the people that I worked with, we all kind of grew up at the company together because, you know, we found our place. We loved working there. It was hard work, but it was very satisfying work. And if you're in retail, why not sell the best there is to sell? I mean, really, I mean, it sounds like it was a good company for people to stay there yes. that amount of time. Exactly. That if you grew up with so many people there, then they must have really treated their employees well. Exactly. And, yeah. And, and another thing I remember when I met you talking about different fashion shows and places you had to go. And we asked you if you missed them. And do you remember what you told us? I don't. Maybe you should. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but then, yeah, which I, I, you know, sometimes it's like, ooh, that looks so really, that looks so cool to go to. That looks like that'd be great right. to go to. But I imagine you had to go to quite a few of those. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have to say that I did go to a lot of fashion shows in my career. And I mean, part of it, I was in the business, not because I loved fashion, I love the business of fashion and there is a difference. I love that the business of fashion is very fast paced. You have to make a lot of bets on what you think the consumer is going to want months and months in advance because you're buying inventory way, way in advance and you're buying not inexpensive inventory. You know, it's expensive inventory. And so I love the thrill of that. And so when we went to a fashion show and whether it was a, you know, brand new designer or somebody who'd been around a long time, if there was just extraordinary, you know, merchandise, uh, dresses, bags, whatever, coming down a runway, that just got us so excited. Talk about a hot flash. That was <laughs> oh my goodness. So, uh, you know, that would just get us really, really excited. The industry lost one of its brightest talents. Virgil Pablo uh, passed away at a very young age, and he was really on the cutting edge of fashion as a young African-American designer. And I can remember being at his very first show, and we just knew that he was going to be a star. And, and it's, it's really so saddens me, and it's tragic that somebody lost their life so young to such a terrible uh, disease as uh, uh, some sort of cardiac cancer. Cancer, but, right. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I will say that seeing people like that at the very beginnings of their career, you know, there was nothing better, frankly. That's what made it exciting going to the shows. When you were at the shows, how did you know when someone had it? Like you were just saying he was a young designer, this first show, and you just knew he had something. How did you recognize that? What spoke to you that said this designer is going to be big? Yeah, you know, it's funny because I do think that 
like any business, you, you know, develop kind of a, a second sense of things. And I think at the time, even though he didn't like this term, there was this kind of emerging part of fashion called streetwear, which rather than, you know, kind of the designers on high, you know, giving us what the trends were going to be, there was this, you know, emergence of what people were wearing on the streets that was moving upwards. And it was clear that he kind of was embracing these two worlds. And, and so there was just something unique about it. And I think that with a lot of these designers, especially the new ones who come on the scene, it's just kind of in that moment where they, you know, did they have, did they have that kind of listening skill, if you will, of what was going on in the world and the way women were starting to adjust and think about how they wanted to dress and present themselves. And so it was partly just training over the years, but there was also, you know, just kind of a second sense of things. And today, even though I'm not around, you know, the fashion industry nearly as much as I was, obviously, I can still go through the fashion shows and, you know, I can pick out what I think is like just unbelievable. And then I have to ask people who are still in it, well, what did you think of this? You know, most of the time, I'm generally in the, in the, right, uh, in the right ballpark. Wow. I think that's a great skill. I wish I had developed that skill. <laughs> I, I, bet, I bet it is something that just happens over time yeah, when you're, if you're around it you know it's like anything else you know you just you know you're around people who talk about it think about it philosophize about it you know and I, I think some of it and some of it definitely can be learned there's other parts of it you just can't learn and you have to kind of know and that's not something that I necessarily have but I think that I, I learned a lot and picked up a lot of kind of what was important along the way. So what advice would you give to other women that are trying to get to the position where you were like, yeah, I mean, you've said, you know, it's a lot of hard work, of course. I mean, it doesn't sound, or I don't know, you know, I wasn't there the whole 30 years, but that you had to really, did you have to break any ceilings or anything like that? Well, I mean, I think that there was plenty of that, you know, sometimes you, you kind of don't even realize, you know, that you're, you know, breaking a glass ceiling because you're in that moment and you're, you're just thinking about, okay, this, you know, this is how it has to play out. If I'm going to advance myself in an organization, I think it's only with hindsight that I can appreciate that. I mean, of course there were dozens and dozens of times when I was the only woman in the room, whether it was with the brand partners that we did business with in Europe that were you know, early on, pretty much dominated by French and Italian men, or, you know, the private equity firms that owned Neiman Marcus along the way is predominantly men. The people around the table in our conference room, our executive leadership team, when I first became a senior vice president, predominantly men. I mean, that changed over time, but I was definitely a catalyst in that. And so I think that I only recognize that I probably did break some sort of glass along the way in hindsight and not while I was living it every day there I did find when I retired I was going through all my files and I did find this note I had sent to HR when I was first a vice president I can't even believe I did this to be honest with you I sent a note to the VP of human resources outlining why I thought I should get a raise And I outlined in this note that I believed I was being paid less than some of the men in the same positions because they were not dual income households, that the man was the only one working in the household. And so the company was paying that man more than me because my husband and I, you know, we were all always dual income earners and whether whether that was the case or not, I don't even know where I got my courage to do something like that because that was not like me to do that. But at some point, obviously, I thought something was unfair about what was going on. So, by the way, I did not get my raise. Oh, I was going to ask that. Did you get the raise? (laughs) Oh, my. But I think that was probably a valid feeling that you felt because, yeah. So, Mm -hmm. 
but but at the end of the day, what well, I don't know what's the story about the tortoise and the hare. You know, I yes, tortoise. I may have been moving slower, but I ended up, you know, yes, winning the race. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Nice. So, what Bridget had started our conversation off was mentioning that we every year like to go through the Neiman Marcus catalog, yeah. and pick the extravagant gifts. And I asked Bridget, I'll describe one, and I will ask her to guess the price on it, and. My question is, how do you pick the extravagant gifts each year for the, like what, how do you choose them? Yeah, so it is such an interesting tale of kind of these extravagant gifts. They were just a, a, a bit of history. They were started basically in the, in the end of the 1940s or 19, early 1950s when Stanley Marcus, who was the son of the founder, he was running the company then. He wanted to do something just to get press. And so he went out and found really crazy things. And, you know, whether it was camels or, you know, there was a, 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 a Egyptian sarcophagi that we sold. I mean, there were all kinds of crazy gifts. And the, and, and the story was true. I mean, that's why he went out to find these kind of crazy gifts is he wanted the press. And sure enough, that press, you know, pretty much stuck with us for, you know, I don't know, six, six decades, you know, past. And there was, when I joined the company, you know, I was 28 when I joined the company, there was a woman on the team and that was her sole role was to go find these crazy gifts or think about things that might resonate with our customers that, you know, might make them think twice about whether they should buy things or not. And the whole time that I was at Neiman Marcus through my CEO role, those eight years, we had somebody on our team who they had other things that they did, but one of their sole responsibilities was going to find these gifts. And over time, we got lots of incoming calls from people who had, okay, I'm going to cuss, crazy ass things. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay <laughs> that part's a it's a donkey yes. <laughs> and, and other times you know she was out there trying to really kind of think about you know what what was where was the head of the consumer about things so and at some point you know price really wasn't it wasn't a, it wasn't about the price it was about kind of either the aesthetic value, the craziness of it all, you know, that, those kinds of things. And I'd say over time, like in my probably, you know, 30 years of the company, those gifts, we sold, you know, some years we didn't sell any of them. Other years we'd sell, you know, seven of 10. And I mean, you know, so kind of our batting average actually was pretty good given that they were crazy gifts. That was know? my next question. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> me trouble selling them, but yeah. So there was a couple of just crazy stories. So as I said, when Stanley Marcus was still running the company, he bought these camels, and there was a woman in Fort Worth that bought the camels, and they, I guess, camels live a really long life, and and they lived on her property in Fort Worth for all the years, and she passed away, and then. Her daughter, I think, you know, called the company trying to figure out what to do with the camels. <laughs> I mean, no. so you I, can't return the camels. <laughs> 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 Everything, but we didn't take back the camel. But uh, <laughs> another, another year, we sold this full set of armor to a gentleman. I think it was like seventy-five or eighty-five thousand dollars. I can't remember, and he wanted it. I don't know to wear. I don't know. You know, you can't ask too many questions about this stuff, and. It was, it was a small person's, I mean, it, you know, they, it wasn't a big, and he bought it and he loved it. You know, we had, we had just really funny stories that the year after, oh, so 9-11 was in September of 2000. That year, of course, these gifts are, you know, put together like six or nine months in advance. That year, we had this submarine, a personal submarine that you could buy, guessing in the, few million dollar range. And after 9-11, the woman, her name is Ginger Reeder. She doesn't, she retired from the company also. She got a call from, I don't know, either the FBI or CIA wanting to know, had we sold any of these personal submarines? 
because of course after 9-11 they were paranoid about everything so we had gotten inquiries we had not sold any so you know the ever like every gift had its own kind of story that lived past it so it was really fun. And, you know, every year we were on the Today Show, you know, kind of pitching the, pitching the gifts, if you will. It was really fun. It, it, there, was, there was a lot of nice storytelling around those gifts. Yeah, I, I never have guessed a single one correctly. <laughs> <laughs> the price wise. Yeah. I'll it's either, just a couple yeah, of thousand. thousand. <laughs> I, or I'll overshoot it or I'll way undershoot it. And yeah. It's what there was one this year. It was a uh, Harry Winston oh, diamond. It was, it was a diamond that was, it was set like in a, a Harry Winston band. Was it like 40 something carats? I can't remember. 30.86. Oh, 30. Okay. 30. 30 okay. And it was so funny. I said, well, wonder if two people want that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's interesting about those jewelry pieces, because we started doing more of that because there's a lot of interest. I mean, people buy those things just like they buy a, really fine piece of art. And, and uh, the world is running out of big diamonds. And so it's actually, you know, what whatever the cost was, and I don't remember. I think it was 6 million, right? Yeah. I think it was, I think it was. Okay, I would have thought it was more. I'll have to go back. Guess 20 million. Yes, and I said you could buy three of them, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I said, but okay. I mean, it's running out of big diamonds. So, you know, I mean, there is, you know, there's all those stories that go along with these gifts. So it's all, it's all, it's very interesting. We were just always curious if they actually sold. So thank you yes. for answering. Yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Cause that had been, yeah. I just really wanted to know that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And there, I mean, always interesting, the Apollo theater dinner and dancing. Right. I mean, always really create. And I noticed over the last couple of years, there's more sustainable things and right. they're definitely more environmentally friendly and so that's, they're catering to the audience, definitely. It's, and that's exactly the way we approached the gifts. We really had to think about where was the consumer in terms of how they wanted to spend their money. And, you know, there was a decade's worth of gifts. Many were around these crazy experiences around the world, things that you just didn't have access to, no matter like how, you know, wealthy you were. And so we were able to present really interesting experiences that, you know, people would bring to us or we'd hear about or we'd read about and bring that to, to our customers. Yeah, those were some of mine and Colleen's favorites. We yes. Were, yes, we were like, let's go. Let's do this one right, right. now. We'll, do, we'll, we'll create we'll, dishes. What was the dishes this year? We'll go to, to Prague and yeah. like, <laughs> Portugal. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, all those things are really, you know, anybody would like to do them. It's just whether you have the meat. Right. Yes. So. Yeah. You were interviewed and you had discussed three things that you felt were really important for a CEO to kind of be successful in their industry. And I thought one of, one of the ones, and it kind of goes back a little bit to what you were discussing before about taking calculated risks. And you had said that innovative leaders allow their organization to take some calculated risks. Do you think you did that a lot through your nine years as CEO? I, I think uh, I, if I was giving myself a, you know, a grade on how much I allowed the team to take risks, I would say I'd give myself a B plus. And again, you know, hindsight gives you real perspective that I wish I had pushed them more and, uh, and, and also surrounded myself with a few more people who were true risk takers. Um, you know, as I said earlier, part of the big risk that retailers have to take, and certainly luxury retailers, is that we had to buy all of the merchandise for our stores and online literally six to nine months. In. So we were, we were trying to guess how consumers were going to feel about things. You know, some of us can't even figure out what we want for dinner tonight, much less what we're going to want to wear to an event in nine months. And that in itself was just a huge risk for us. But there were so many other things that we probably could have been even greater risk takers. And I think that, again, sometimes it's just not easy and you have to surround yourself as a CEO with people who are going to help push you to think more like that. And especially these days, it's become even more important than it was just a few years ago when I was a CEO. 
Right. Yeah, world events happen. Well, just like you said, 9-11 and COVID yeah, the happens. the pandemic. Yes, supplies are in, you know, our things are in short supply. You, reti- you retired mm-hmm. right before the pandemic hit, correct? I, I retired just about four years ago, so a couple of years before the p- pandemic hit. Um, I'm happy I retired. <laughs> <laughs> Timing was really good. But mm-hmm. at times like that, when there are world events like the recession, and how do luxury brands, how are they affected? How do you keep going when luxury items are really not on the priority list for a lot of people? Yeah, no, I think it's a really good question. And we, we went through, uh, I, I was uh, the president of becoming the CEO when we went through the recession and everybody just stopped. And, you know, it was, I mean, there was a huge backlash against luxury goods and we had a tough couple of years. But the fact of the matter was that people, affluent people want beautiful things in their life. And those customers came back because they weren't willing to trade down in terms of quality of what they wanted. And they might have bought less when they, you know, came back to start repurchasing, but they weren't going to buy something cheaper. And so the luxury market, you know, shortly after the recession just came roaring back. And we probably had our best, you know, five years after that. So You know, as the recession took place, obviously slowed down, e-commerce was really coming into its own then. And so those, you know, five or six years, the business was amazing. And I think kind of the same thing happened during COVID, good or or bad from, you know, the, the thoughts about what happened to so many people, so many terrible things to people during COVID, the, the affluent people, you know, somewhat around the world, certainly in the U.S., they didn't have anything to really spend their money on. And so, you know, they weren't traveling, they weren't going out to restaurants, they weren't having, you know, weddings, parties, all of those kinds of things. And so there was a pent-up demand and the luxury market worldwide is just seeing just another incredible boom. It's just growing enormously. And that's a combination of the, the affluent that have been shopping you know, luxury for, you know, many generations. And there's also this new customer that's come into buying luxury because they've either made money through the market or they're, you know, entrepreneurs that have made money or, you know, whatever it is. So the luxury market is is booming uh, once again. It's amazing too, the uh, resale on certain luxury items. So it's it's a huge business. I'm on the board of the... The real real, which is the oh, oh, I think you told me that, and I love the real real. I love the real real, but I have definitely sold back some items, or I've sold things that I just didn't use for more than I paid for them. Exactly, and I I have yeah. There, there are uh, consumers who the thought of they they still want the best, but they also want to know that they're doing something good you know, for the environment. So they're very comfortable buying vintage, if you will. And the real, real is the beneficiary of the consumer. Like you're saying, Bridget, you mm-hmm. sell your product to them. And then, you know, your daughter is buying. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. But, they're, yeah, it, it, it's great. It is great. Yeah, uh, and it is sustainable. That's exactly, another, exactly. right. So, uh, anyway, I think that the luxury business in all of its facets, is doing extremely well these days. It is. And so you were saying, so you're you're on the board of The Real Real, you said? Yeah. And so that's, I was going to ask another question is, you you retired, but you still have a lot to do. So I know you're on several boards. And just, you know, any advice in general for women that are approaching retiring or retiring and saying, what do I want to do now? Yeah, no, I think it is such a good question. I, I wish I wish somebody had been more thoughtful with me when I was getting ready to retire. You know, they say when you retire, you have to have a plan and don't retire until you have a plan. And I didn't have a plan. And although <laughs> I didn't get a plan, I didn't have a plan. So I but, I, but I will say, you know, kind of almost four years into it, I, I found a good kind of path for myself. But you know, I know a lot of people retire, they find hobbies that they're interested in. I don't really 
have any hobbies. Although I did learn to be a pretty good cook during COVID, but, but, you know, I, I spend my personal time, you know, between, I have a not-for-profit in Dallas, our Perot Science Museum that I'm the chair of the board of, and I'm just devoted to it because their sole focus, their sole mission is STEM education, which is critically important for, you know, both, you know, underserved uh, communities, women, everybody. We need more people who want to, who get a great STEM education and who want to participate in engineering, technology, math, those kinds of things. You know, I, I do think that women of a certain age, we need to purge. And I have become a champion of purging things in my life because I've recognized after having myself and my husband, our parents pass away over the last number of years, what, what an emotional, you know, battle it was getting through their things. And I'm trying to, you know, kind of play it forward to my son and, you know, his his partner, so that they don't have to do that, you know, God forbid when the time comes that, uh, and keeping the things that are truly most precious to us. And, and it's actually in many ways been really a wonderful, uplifting exercise to go through. So I would highly recommend purging. Uh, I, I'm lucky enough, I've been able to join some public company boards, and I advise some small, you know, entrepreneurs, but uh, I've kind of found my my lane, but it's not always easy for women, I don't think. I think, you know, uh, we're not as, I don't think, as good a networkers as men are. And so, you know, I wish I'd been a better networker as the younger woman. Mm-hmm. No, I, I could see that, though, because we also were have children. A lot of us do. Not everybody does. But, oh, no, but lots having. Of yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and having that part of our life and then they move away. And yeah. so that's really hard. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking to us today. It was so good to see you again because it was really for having me. I really appreciate it. I love what you're doing. I just oh, thanks. I'm so impressed. Um, oh, thank you. The people you've had on. Thank, thank you. you, Karen. Thank you.